This is where we need to change the frame in the conversation around privacy is this idea that an abuse video of a child, and I won't go into like detail about it, but like the worst kind of abuse video of a young child. The idea that that video, which is illegal, is someone else's personal data, I reject. I don't agree that another person should be able to be in possession of that video because it means that the victim is still being victimized in some way. Someone else is taking part in their abuse. It means that they can use that video to normalize the sexualization of children with other people in other communities. They could use it to groom other kids. Even at the most basic level, it just shouldn't be there. Like, it should just be gone, right? It shouldn't exist anymore. It's definitely not someone else's. Welcome to Cause and Purpose, the show about the leaders, innovators, and change agents working on the front lines to solve some of the world's greatest social challenges. I'm Mike Spear, and our guest today is the founder and CEO of the Heat Initiative, Sarah Gardner. With social media and cloud-based storage becoming more and more ingrained in our culture, issues of privacy, trust, and safety have emerged as one of the key challenges of our day. The right to privacy is one of the most important provisions of the U.S. Constitution, and it's a right that's increasingly important, not just to us, but to our children. Images on the internet essentially last forever, so it's more crucial than ever to be aware of and intentional about the images we share of ourselves and our most vulnerable loved ones. The effort to preserve the privacy and confidentiality of our online conversations and data storage has given rise to unprecedented proliferation of illegal child sexual abuse material, CSAM for short. Technology exists to eliminate CSAM and other dangerous and illegal content from the internet while preserving the privacy of those of us using the internet in good faith. If only the tech companies providing storage and messaging services choose to utilize it. This is the origin and the driving motivation of the Heat Initiative. They've launched a multi-channel campaign to pressure Apple and eventually other technology providers as well to do the right thing, to eliminate harmful sexual abuse material from their platforms and to bring the perpetrators of this type of sex trafficking to justice. The HEAT initiative is exactly the type of program we love at Cause and Purpose. An elegant, no-nonsense solution to a complex social issue. We loved meeting Sarah and learning a bit about her journey as an impact leader. Hope you enjoy it. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. I've been really excited to talk to you since we spoke in December. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Great way to start 2024. I knew when we spoke that this would be a fun one. Clearly, you have this great experience, and I think we look at the industry in similar ways. I'd like to start, you know, where I start most of these things with your early childhood. You brought up having a quote unquote DC upbringing, mm -hmm. relatives in the State Department. You got a screenwriter, an ESL teacher. Tell me about what it was like growing up and kind of how that influenced you as you were attracted to social impact work. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that question. Um, don't get a lot of opportunities to talk about that very often. Despite growing up in LA and in the San Fernando Valley, which is, you know, the sweet valley high, uh, that's like the, <laughs> the type of content that was coming out from my childhood of where I grew up. I had parents that were really grounded in kind of showing us that there was this bigger world outside of LA. And I think like any town or city that can be kind of dominated by one industry, the goal was to make sure that we knew there were a lot of different things that we could do with our lives. And so, you know, you mentioned my dad's a screenwriter and my mom was an ESL teacher. Just the funniest way that manifested is hearing them argue about the grammar of characters in screenplays. Like... Uh, arguments about uh, should they be using the proper like noun, verb, adjective agreement or like how they would actually be speaking. Or like Harry wouldn't say that to Megan, you know, and these are like fictional characters. So that was just kind of fun. But uh, I do think my dad, especially being a screenwriter, kind of instilled in me, you can do anything and you can do anything that's hard if you're willing to kind of put in the work. And also be on the receiving end of a lot of criticism and a lot of setbacks. Mm. Screenwriting is like 
uh, I, I don't really understand the ability that you have to have to be so passionate about what you do, but then have just people immediately kind of tear it apart is pretty, pretty <laughs> real. Um, so that was, that was interesting to watch. And at the same time, you know, it's a conversation that I'm having like actively with my own kids now driving around LA. Um, when you see people who are in really bad situations and uh, don't have homes, don't have food. And like your kids are asking you these questions. How do people end up like this? Why aren't people helping them? Like these were the same conversations I had with my dad and my mom. And they spent a lot of time talking about like the randomness of birth and like you're here and they're there and you you could be them and they could be you, which is why we have a duty to to help in whatever way that is and that's actually helpful versus like what your ideas of help look like. So very lucky. And then the worldliness aspect was just having my mom grew up overseas in Pakistan and how that played out is really valuing your objects and getting like one and good one of each, <laughs> not excess, were sort of those basic principles that were instilled. Your mom sounds like, and I'm, maybe I'm reading into this a little bit, but a very compassionate person. I mean, it, it yeah. strikes me that choosing to be an ESL teacher probably connects with a sense of isolation she felt living in Pakistan. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I wish she was here to talk to you about this, too. <laughs> she loves this. They had like a gentleman who they adored in Pakistan who cooked for their family, like the State Department. There were a lot of jobs that were supported locally, like by these families being there. And his name was Ghoul. And she, her interactions with him is like, he would teach her the local language and sort of the ways of the Pakistani people. And then she taught him English and that's where mm. it started. So I think it was like wanting to have deeper connection with someone who you couldn't communicate with and that feeling like not right, how do we fix that? So. You're right. That started very young. Yeah. Did you ever get to go visit Pakistan? Did your folks ever take you back there? No, no. I know we talk about this a lot, just how much the world's changed. Like her vacation stories is like a 12 year old was like, uh, when we were driving through the Khyber Pass in Afghanistan, you know, like it's really interesting to reflect on the places she was and grew up and thinking about are, are these places Americans can still go and and then, of course, that landscape is always changing mm -hmm. in this current moment. But one thing that was really fun was at my last job, I hired this fabulous gentleman, Bilal, who was from Lahore, Pakistan, which is where she grew up, born there, raised there. And I do think it gave us this like incredible connection because he just couldn't get over the fact that we knew anything about anywhere mm -hmm. Near where. Yeah. And so it was a good reminder of to try and make those connections and go back to those roots. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, having been in the film industry myself, what what kind of work did your father do? Uh, oh, or does he like, still, is he still writing? Well, you just tapped into a gem. Um, <laughs> no, no, because this is a fun one. It's a really great way to make fun of me. So my dad wrote a movie, the, the best, most well-known one is a movie called Dan in Real Life. Steve Carell is in it, Julia Binoche. Oh, wow. And it's a dad and his daughters navigating their life uh, after their mom passed away. So like already the joke was like, he had to kill my mom for this story because he need there needed to be like a romantic tension. And the first time I read the script, like there were only two daughters and it was me and my sister, like to a T. And I was like, this is too close. So he made a third daughter and tried to diffuse them mm. uh, uh, across the, the three daughters. But you can still tell like who is which one. And there's a line in it where one of the daughters accuses him of being a murderer of love, which was a true quote from my 16 year old <laughs> oh, self. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, you know, I guess he wasn't afraid of putting himself into his work. <laughs> no, no. Wow. Incredible. That was embarrassing um, for us, but for everybody else. <laughs> yeah. I love the idea that you mentioned that your folks took you around Los Angeles to see how other people lived and yeah. give you a sense of you know, the other side, so to speak. How did that influence you? Or were there other things that you did as a family that led mm -hmm. you down the path to philanthropy or social impact or helping others? Yeah, I really appreciate these questions. Because again, it's always interesting to look back and, and, and people kind of jump ahead a lot to like, mm. how did you get interested in this issue? But I think 
what you're getting at, which is different, is this idea of a calling to make your life about something else besides yourself. And in probably like my most honest moments, there are a lot of different issues that I could have worked on, but that life of service came from my family. I did go to Catholic school from kindergarten through high school, but I went to like LA liberal Catholic school, coming across some pretty badass nuns who would like go to Thailand in the summer and volunteer at shelters with trafficked girls. And so just acknowledging that was a very different experience than what most people experience. I started volunteering and doing some work like that pretty early. And by the time I was graduating college, I had already honed in on wanting to work for a few specific leaders in like the social impact space. So then it was kind of like, who could I get to first? And how could I convince them to hire me? Um, So I was really uh, calculated about it. Like I found out where my first, first, first boss, Kevin Bales, like he was coming into LA to speak. He worked at a group that combated modern forms of forced labor and slavery. He was speaking at like an actress's house. So I like found a way to get into that party. (laughs) And then like went up to him and I was like, I'll work for free. Like, what do you need me to do? And he was like, move to DC and we'll talk about it. So I did. Wow. You've really created your own opportunities, it sounds like. Yeah. I I think you share this too. Just I know a little bit about like your life's work too. But one thing that was easy for me, and I'm doing that in quotes, was like I always knew kind of what I wanted to do. And I've seen a lot of my friends struggle with that. And there have been a lot of other aspects of things that have been challenging and tough. And I'm not saying that that's just been like easy peasy, but... It did, and I'd be curious how you felt in your career, it did give me kind of a sense of clarity about like where to go, who to push, what to do next. And I, I'd never felt lost hmm. from a career standpoint. And I think that that is unusual and also really lucky. I, and I don't take that for granted. I think it is unusual. I think for myself, my dad was entrepreneurial and he he always ran his own businesses and he instilled in us as kids that that was the way to go. Um, there was also an exercise that we did. I remember around the dinner table where he asked us, given the choice that we could only pick one, would we rather be famous, successful, happy, or like a virtuous person? And the right answer was like a good person. It's like a teenager. It's a good thought exercise. Yeah. And it really stands out in memory. There's also the message that if you have to, you sacrifice happiness or personal gain to you know, have that ethical or moral code. And so I think for me, it was always important to have purpose be infused in my career and enjoy the people I was working with. And he also sort of gave the grace to us as kids that, that he needed himself to not really have it figured out. My yeah. career wound all over the place. I mean, if I look back on it, I think there is a clear through line. But yeah. starting out in film and television, going to journalism joining a social impact startup, like it's it's really, (laughs) it's all over the place, but it's, it has that consistency of like trying to tell stories and influence people to see the world in new ways and and contribute to the the public good or just contribute directly, you know, in the case of past jobs and what I'm doing now. But yeah, I I always had a clarity of purpose Mm -hmm. that way, but had, have often been lost in terms of like what the next move should be. And I've just sort of followed it as I went. Thank you for the question. It's interesting to, to go back and think about it now. Yeah. I'm just trying to think about like why it was so clear, but I agree with you. It was also, I think one part of it that I actually did have to sort of de-undo is the idea of you can't do it and also have personal gain, right? Which is like something that I think is going to hopefully be a shift in our lifetime. Mm of like the people who are trying to help people get paid no money and can't want money. But then if you're the, you know, founder of a shapewear company and just making gazillions of dollars off of people, that's cool. And they can pay themselves, you know, $7 million. Um, I hope that we realize that it's, you know, I know this is like very, an easy thing to say, but like, that that actually needs to flip if we want to yeah. if we want to solve some of the world's problems and so 
what I appreciate about like what you've done too is because mine is sort of more traditional, like nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's had its own limitations. But I also actually like the idea of interweaving between nonprofit, for profit to find like, what is that balance where you can be making an impact, but also be allowed to want to provide at a certain level for yourself, your family, whomever. No, absolutely. I think in some ways we're, we're preaching to the choir for the audience here, but yes, I, I agree wholeheartedly. It shouldn't be a sacrifice. It should be parity. It should be, you know, market rate for skills and complexity of the organization and, and yeah. impact at the end of the day. I don't know that I was ever, it's funny. I don't get to talk about this stuff in this format much myself. My dad passed in 2005. So I, I kind of like mm -hmm. look back and just these little snippets, these little anecdotes. He was an attorney and he never loved it. Like he, he worked mm -hmm. on corporate stuff or litigation and it just didn't speak to him. I think he would have been happier doing other stuff, but I was very aware of how he, t he had this sort of corporate, this, this career in pursuit of money, but there were so many setbacks. Like a lot of his clients would hide their money, declare bankruptcy, they would go on vacation, tell them about it. So I don't think I ever connected the notion mm -hmm. of the sort of self-serving financial career with actual financial advancement. Ah, uh, interesting. At least not a one-to-one, -one, right? It's still risky. I was also aware, both my parents tell this story about how his favorite ever case was, was, I guess it was when my parents were dating and he got this phone call in a restaurant, you know, before there were cell phones or pagers or anything, he was paged by his office. And it was about this guy who couldn't afford an attorney who was being evicted from his apartment that night. Wow. And he got to go in and intercede and make sure that the person stayed housed. Uh, and that was a little, you know, evening, that little moment I know was the most rewarding case of his career. Wow. That's really powerful. Yeah. So, and I guess it was for me too, because I remember these little things. And I think, you know, the total, the sum total of these experiences and conversations and stories very much pushed me in the direction that I ended up going. I'm curious, you know, I was never a person in high school or college who, like, I've never really had a, a mentor, you know, per se. Um, I've, I have people I look up to and have influenced me, obviously, but never had like a really direct mentor. And, and certainly at that age, didn't have individuals the way you describe, like that you mm -hmm. really look up to and want to go work with. So I'm curious, you mentioned one person, but I'm curious who else is on that list? Like who, who out there in the impact space did you really look up to and still do and, and find inspiration from or connection with? Yeah. Oh, there's so many. That That's probably another area where I did just like get lucky. I had a really, really good boss for 10 years. And it was my former boss at Thorn, Julie Cordova. She would hate the word that I was like using boss, but looking back on it now and watching some of my friends or contemporary colleagues, like what they were experiencing, so much of what you learn in those early years is like you're modeling yourself after someone else. You're observing them in meetings. You're you're like, oh, that's something I want to take or like this is something I would – I also want to take, but I want to make it my own, you know. And hearing like horror stories of just like really bad leadership. And, and, and I also think it was at a time where it wasn't demanded, right? Like yeah. hopefully now – and it's – I'm not saying it's all – been fixed, but like there are conversations right now about like good management and how to do that. And it's not just the like pay your dues in the abusive environment and like move on kind of mentality. But I got to experience the best version of that before that was even a requirement. And so why was she such a great boss? She gave me like total freedom in areas that she knew I had, like fundraising, where I, I brought more experience even into the relationship. And so the dynamic was already like, oh, I defer to you. And I was young, you know, I was like 26, 27. But then also would give me really, really great feedback and pushed me to improve and would give me real feedback, which is really hard, give me real mm -hmm. feedback, but in a way that was kind. And I remember we used to have this phrase there, it was like, clarity is kind, even if someone isn't performing well, being clear about that sooner and explaining why and being really clear about how you could fix it and stuff is better than 
just not wanting to deal with it. And then nine months later, like having a bad review and the person's like, what, what are you talking about? So just some really, really great skills I learned from watching her and her lead teams. The co-founders of Thorn also were great mentors to me. That part, again, feels really lucky because you get a string of bad experiences like that. And I think it can really damage your trust. And I don't have that. I'm very trusting in my work relationships and in my personal relationships because I haven't sort of been burned by someone in that way. And that feels like a real gift. Yeah, I think it is. And I think it's very unusual, you know, as as you probably know. I don't think I had that same experience. (laughs) (laughs) Took me a while to come around to that, I think. I think it's so unusual, but so many people do have to go through that, you know? Yeah. But I think it says a lot about you too. I mean, it's not just what happens to us. It's how we treat it, right? You, You took advantage of that opportunity and turned it into something positive where somebody else might have struggled with that kind of latitude. Let's go back a little bit. You were an art history major <laughs> in college. Oh, do you want to talk about Dutch Netherlandish portraiture between 1250 and 1550? <laughs> Maybe we'll call you back on that podcast when we launch it. And I, I yeah. know you told me that you were surprised to be going to technology, but how did you make the jump from there to like yeah, social yeah. impact tech? So the tech part, the, the first... Mm-hmm. Jump back to like, oh yeah, it's social good, nonprofit versus like becoming a gallerist or whatever. I did get the opportunity to travel around the world the year after I graduated from college. My grandfather passed away and he left me a little bit of money that I could only use to travel. That was like the only stipulation. Oh, wow. So it was like the best gift of all time. And if I could do something similar for my own kids, because it was that container that really like forces you, right? So it was like I was overseas for six or seven months. And um, it was already in my mind, I'm going to end up somewhere kind of working in the field of at that time, it was more like sex trafficking. And I was in Cambodia with a bunch of people that I had met traveling and Uh, We were in Phnom Penh and I was at a hostel and on all the hostels everywhere on all the signs, it's like, you're not allowed to bring escorts back to the hostels. And, you know, there's all this, there's all this like very explicit language there because they have such an issue with sex tourism and all this stuff. So you sort of think like, okay, like everybody's aware, like this isn't going to happen. But we were sitting outside of that hostel, a whole group of us, we'd all met there drinking beers and this motorcycle pulls up with like an adult Cambodian man on it and this like little Cambodian girl, she was probably like 10, 11. And so she jumps off and this like older white guy comes down the stairs um, next to us and they meet and they turn around and go back up the stairs. So you're like, this is not right. And it's like out and wide open in front of a huge group of 20 people. Like nothing about it either is like trying to hide what's going on. So, you know, I had my like Lonely Planet physical book um, and was like scrolling through it, trying to find the number to call. And and then we had a debate about like, do we go up there and knock on the door? But that also puts the child at risk. Um, You have to be like really, really, really careful in these kinds of situations about – your own desire to like stop what's happening versus like what's actually in the best interest of the people involved. Anyway, so 20 minutes later, they came down the stairs, the motorcycle came back, off goes the girl. It's like dead silent. And then it's like, are we going to say something to him? And he goes, oh, the kitchen's closed. Like I'm going to go somewhere else for food. And he like walks off and I didn't say anything. And I have regretted it every single moment since. And I regret my just general lack of inaction. And I think about all the time, like, how old is she now? How old am I now? What's her life been like? Did she have kids? And so that was the moment where it switched from, like, I'm interested in this to, like, I have to dedicate my life to this now. Like, I messed up. And I'll never get that opportunity back, but Mm -hmm. I can try my best in the future. So that was, like, my way back to the issue And then just to keep it a little more condensed to around the tech part. Um, So I was working at an organization that focused on 
more like sex trafficking, forced labor. And there was a new nonprofit that had started. And I met with the CEO, Julie, who I was mentioning before. And there was another incredible colleague that I had there, this woman named Claire Schmidt, who's one of the smartest people I know. And they had an interesting proposal, which was they had been given the latitude by their founder and by the funders to basically spend a year looking at this field and to understand what were the actual gaps from a technology standpoint and what were some proposals to fix it. So like that's incredibly unique. You know this, like to be given the security of like, you don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to fundraise all this money right away. Like actually just go out and observe and talk to everyone. So I was one of the people they talked to and they talked to like over a hundred individuals. And at that time it was like law enforcement, other NGOs, people at tech companies. And it became really clear that all the technology that like the counterterrorism units have access to, other issue areas have access to were not trickling down to the child exploitation units in the U.S., that those units were starved for resources, people, but but really specifically tech. And investigators showing us trying to find sex trafficking victims they were looking for in the U.S. and literally like showing us notebooks where they were writing down clues they had found in escort ads, like things that could just so easily be transformed by like pretty basic tech too. Like like this wasn't even like, we need AI. So we were like, this is the gap. And so at that point they asked me to join them because they did realize they were going to have to fundraise and do other things. And that was my background, but it was a big experiment and we did not know if it was going to work. And it taught me early that you have to be really transparent with the donors. And actually the more transparent you are with the donors, the more they'll trust you. We were like, we're going to try this and we're going to see if it works. And then we're going to tell you and we're going to be straight up with you about it. And it was interesting how, like for some, that's not the vibe. Like they want, tell me how much to give so I can help X amount of people. But for others, that perked their interest. And they were like, Mm -hmm. I'll try that. Um, And so that was really fun time. Just to provide some additional context, the first organization you're speaking about is Free the Slaves. Yes. And the second is Thorn. Yes. It's so unusual. I'm glad you brought this up. It's so unusual in, in our sector to have the latitude to innovate, to take the time to look in the cracks and see what's missing, yes. to look look for unintended consequences, yes. to you know try and fail, um, and to be transparent about that with your stakeholders. Can you unpack this more, share more about your experience as a major gifts officer, as well as leader <laughs> of an organization? how you view this and some of the experiences you've had? Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate that. In my early years at Free the Slaves, I observed the dynamic of, and it, it, this isn't um, saying anything about Free the Slaves, it was really sort of more true at the time of, I think, funding, fundy, grantee relationships in general. Mm-hmm. A lot of time the funder comes in and has like ideas of what should happen, right? Or like, I have I I really like what you're doing in Ghana, but like, can you do it in you know, Haiti or whatever? And like, it's so tempting to be like, yeah, if you give us enough money, we can just expand it and support organizations there too. And and instead of being like, this is our strategy, right? Because we've pressure tested like what we're capable of doing, where we need to grow, and getting people to share your vision. It's like, I would never go into someone else's job and be like, oh, it should be this way. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. trust, trust that the experts know. And this was like the shift I saw. And it definitely leads our work now, which is like, I respect if this is not the change that you want to see, or this doesn't make sense, or this is just not how you want to give your dollar. But because you want to do this, I can't pivot the organization and the strategy to appease you. And I felt like when you put that energy out instead, you actually attract all the donors, like you attract who you want because they see your confidence and they see your Mm -hmm. 
clarity. And then I think that has also been a huge shift amongst donors and that there's been a really active conversation happening in the philanthropy world over the last 20 years, which has been about not creating that like funder grantee power dynamic. And and there's some tremendous funders out there who have found incredible ways to let the experts and the orgs lead and support, but also push, right? doesn't mean they can't push you. It's just more about how you would invest in a founder and their vision for a company versus what those guardrails would be versus just you're here to carry out my philanthropic dream. (laughs) (laughs) You know? I think many major gifts officers are afraid of losing a gift from somebody who isn't okay with failure or who wants to see a specific thing or, or whatever. But I think your point is, I mean, I agree with it. I think your point is right. That if that's the case, don't be afraid of losing those dollars because they're misaligned anyway. And there'll be more and better, more aligned dollars coming your way. If you're just authentic about it. The money you don't want, if you, it's actually just as important as the money that you do want, because then you don't spend time cultivating it when you actually don't want it. Yeah. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I'm I'm curious with Thorn, they talk about building technology in sort of generic terms. I think with human trafficking and trust and safety, especially if children are involved, I think people in general don't have insight into what that really looks like. Can you share a little bit about like some of the interventions that are really helpful, some of the tech that's needed still or has been built, the, the work that they're continuing to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I really appreciate that. And it actually leads into what I'm doing now too, because this question of like, who develops the best tech, who gets the best tech, who's responsible for it will always be a tension point. And when is it driven by those who are issue focused, but also the companies have a responsibility up into a certain point, right? So when does Mm -hmm. it shift from one to the other? So the cool thing about Thorn is that it is like, made up of technologists. Um, You know, by the time I left, we were majority engineers, data scientists, product people. And then we had all of our like comms, marketing, research, also programmatic like prevention teams, but rare to see that many technical folks at a nonprofit developing like commercial grade technology. So when we say that, if you're an investigator doing dark web investigative cases, why would you not have like the best of the best tech? Like we want that person to have really good technology. So if no one's making it because there's not enough of a market there, that's a gap, right? And that's a gap that actually needs to be filled even if there is no market there because of what it does, which is like Mm -hmm. help identify kids and get them out of really bad situations. I agree with you that it's not the easiest thing to explain. And also one cool challenge we had that that we overcame and something I'm really proud of, um, and I think everyone at Thorne is really proud of, is this idea that like we had to hire cheap engineers then. <laughs> How are we going to recruit technical people? Like they get paid this. And we were like, you know what? We should pay them that. Mm -hmm. And we did. You know, we were competitive with tech companies that were our similar size in terms of like overall budget and so forth. And that was like highly unusual. But we were like, well, we don't want a bad engineer (laughs) working on it. We want a good engineer. So that was cool. And I think now the work that the last thing I'll say is like the work they're doing around AI and where this issue of child sexual abuse and the internet is headed is exactly the kind of work that doesn't happen unless somebody's like really focused on it because the monetization of AI and all that's happening over here. And then what people's brains don't necessarily naturally go to, which I understand is like, well, what could all the harmful effects of this be on kids? Mm -hmm. And so the fact that they've got like brilliant people over there thinking about it is definitely helps me sleep better at night. Yeah. You, you said a couple of things I want to dive a little bit deeper on. As product people, I think there's an instinct to customer discovery is important and all of that, but to to be too responsive to what the market is demanding. Mm. When with many things, with, with innovation, you know, you really want to create what you know 
is right, regardless of what people are asking for. And the, not, the nonprofit entity is uniquely set up for that, right? If there's yeah. a market demand, there would be a for-profit company. How do you lean into that or not at Thorne? Yeah, well, actually, one example of that that has been really successful is our the product they are still running, Safer. Mm. So that is a detect, report, remove of CSAM, and it generates revenue for Thorn now because the market is there. And so that was a really smart way to diversify the funding of the organization is to then be reliant both on philanthropic dollars to help fund the technical solutions that would never have that revenue stream, but then where there is that revenue stream because companies want the product, take advantage of that. And and I think that was something also we realized like is already a model in a lot of nonprofits. Figuring out a way to tap into that revenue where it exists is something that any organization should always be aggressive about if it's there, but also acknowledging like some of the work that we would do with law enforcement, research, things like this. Mm -hmm. To your point, that is going to rely on like the more fundamental principle of like, we need people who care about what's going to happen to the world because of this and that, and we need you to like be altruistic about it and help us come up with the solutions before it really gets bad. So that balance is always interesting. Speaking of a a balancing act, can you talk about that tension, how how you've worked with it through your various roles? Yeah. Where you stand on it now? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of different ways to go, things to sort of express or double click on when you say that. I'm going to ground it in kind of like the work we're doing now at the HEAT Initiative, which is the advocacy effort Mm -hmm. that um, I left Thorne to start with my colleague, Willie Rhodes, and we now have two other colleagues with us. And then, of course, a whole like community of people who care about this and are kind of tapped into the corporate campaign that we're running. So that that turning point for me or where I was like, okay, this is where we need to change the frame again in the conversation around privacy is this idea that an abuse video of a child, um, and I won't go into like detail about it, but like the worst kind of abuse video of a young child. The idea that that video, which is illegal, is someone else's personal data, I reject. So I I don't agree that another person should be able to be in possession of that video because it means that the victim is still being victimized in some way. Someone else is taking part in their abuse. It means that they can use that video to normalize the sexualization of children with other people in other communities. They could use it to groom other kids. I mean, even at the most basic level, it just shouldn't be there. Like it should just be gone, right? Like it should just evaporate. It shouldn't exist anymore, but it, it's definitely not someone else's. So yeah. when I think about privacy, I think about how do we protect adult communication? The examples I think resonate with everybody pretty easily are like journalists, right? Like a journalist in Iran right now who's trying to get information out or in the Middle East, How do we protect that person from getting information out to a reporter in the U.S., to some family member, and yet in the same world hold that we don't want someone then using that same channel to send a bunch of abuse images of a child to someone else? And I think that both can happen. Yeah. How did you know it was time to leave Thorne and start something new? Oh, what a journey. So Apple announced in August 2021, kind of out of nowhere, (laughs) that they were going to do the work of detecting, reporting, and removing known child sexual abuse images. And like, I'm trying to think of an analogy, but like in our world, this was just monumental. It was a company that had not engaged with the community on this issue before, kind of stayed silent, kept their head down, didn't really participate And then they just came out of nowhere and made this announcement. So we were stoked. And then for a whole bunch of reasons, which we can go into if you're interested, but primarily being like sort of the botching of the comms around it and the lack of backbone on their part to receive criticism, they ended up stopping it, pausing it, and then 
eventually killing that plan. And so that the period of that fall, oh yeah, the period of that fall, I just basically like felt sick the whole time. Yeah, (laughs) what a letdown. Something is wrong. Well, but honestly, the thing that scared me the most was like, in addition to the fact that they didn't do it, which now talking with survivors of CSAM, child sexual abuse material or images and videos, like, I'm like, forget how I felt about it. Like, I've heard them say to me, like, that was like, that was like being told we see you, we, we get you, we've got you. And then being like, absolute about face, like, F you, forget it. (laughs) Like that, I mean, it was that for them, it was that intense. So I don't even need to like make my whole thing like, oh, it was so torturous. But it did signal that a company like Apple, who is considered reputable and like rule abiding and has really strong principles in many ways, can make a commitment to this, change its mind, and then nothing, nothing bad happened to them. So the problem is that then that signals to everybody else that this is like totally voluntary or um, you can do it if you want to. And if you don't want to, fine, you know, and I, yeah. we, it wasn't just me, but we all felt like that was a really bad precedent to set. Well, you're right. It, it is different. Like if you never engage with it, then it's easy to, you know, we don't have the resources, the technology, there's policy or something, but right. not, we see you, we get it. We're coming to help. Oh, actually we don't care. <laughs> like it's pretty bad. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I think it's a good opportunity to pause and just, you know, what is the HEAT initiative? Like, what's the organization? What are you guys setting out to do? Tell us about it. Yeah, we're trying to hold tech accountable on the issue of child sexual abuse, images and videos. Um, But our strategy is really bringing corporate campaigning to this space of child sexual abuse in the internet. And so it's been so fun because we're learning from climate activists who have run successful corporate campaigns against major companies and won, and we're Mm. taking their roadmap and trying to recreate it over here. Other efforts, nonprofits, individuals who, who won against Walmart and, you know, big companies got them to change supply chain related issues are teaching us like, Here's how you can move a major company on this. Because unfortunately, it's not the moral argument. They're constantly managing 29 crises at once. And until you become number three, like you're not a problem yet. And so Mm -hmm. we're just thinking about how do we share with the right people, both the decision makers, but also the public, which is why this venue is so appreciated that you're giving us, like, this is wrong. Their policy on this is not right. And we're not saying it's all bad, but this is not right. And honestly, that is one of the things that frustrates me the most, but also makes me feel the most hopeful that we will win eventually because it it is not congruent with some of their other principles around mm-hmm. human rights. And and I think that eventually will become very clear. There will have to be some solution that allows for this type of imagery to come down while still preserving user privacy, as you've mentioned. I think it's an important point. I think we're so quick to you know, paint with a wide brush and say these guys are all good or all bad. And this seems more about integrity. It seems more about you say you stand for these things, but you have yeah. this thing, pretty large thing yeah. Let's fix it. I appreciate, by the way, the, the branding you have on, on the website. I, I've been sensitive over the years. Polaris has dealt with this. Love 146, I think, does a great job of this. But presenting imagery that you know is iconic and gives you a sense of what's going on while still protecting the identity of the folks that are in the images. How yeah. did you guys decide on that style of marketing and branding? <gasps> Yay. We get to shout out to Soze, our creative agency and thought partner who have just been absolutely incredible in helping us do exactly that. So all the people in our content right now are humans, kids are AI. So that was how we got around some of that. But oh, that balance, and this is like a age as old as time challenge that you have in this space that we've also talked about with the climate activists. It's like, Mm -hmm. was the 
polar bear dying on the ice, is that an effective image or not? You know what I mean? You're like, how much do you share? How real do you get? Um, and I think on our issue, obviously, you can't go anywhere near any of it. So it's how else can we elicit that feeling that, that we want people to have, which is like, hold on, what? Like, I, this is not, I, I feel strongly about this. I feel strongly that children should not have to endure this. But it is one of the challenges of this issue is it can be so dark that we don't want to share what's really happening. And then we're actually doing a disservice to the realities of what is happening. And so it, it's always a dance. And they've done an incredible job of helping us navigate, like, where is that line? Yeah. In more ways than one. And and then that also translates into comms too. Like how much do I share about any one case with you? You know, it's tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such an interesting line to walk because you want to drive it home and make it compelling, but not so much that someone's scarred by it or, you know, puts yeah. it down and says too much. Triggered, yeah. And what a cool use of AI too, to actually just not have real people. In yeah. Yeah. Tell us about the campaign. As you're ramping things up, as we're recording this, it's ahead of the Super Bowl. I know there's a big launch planned of some marketing and some some campaigning. What's it all about? What do you want people to take away from it? Right now, we're trying to create really splashy media moments that get everybody's attention that there is a black spot on Apple's record when it comes to this and create some outrage about it. But keeping in mind, like, who can we mobilize and how quickly, right? Like mm. we're not we're not very big. We don't have a big base of people. So how we're always sort of negotiating is like we're trying to get the attention of Apple leadership, of Apple decision makers, uh, board members, the shareholders to raise this volume of like this is an issue we need to address and then create like a really easy way for someone who does feel outrage about it to participate that's not a heavy lift and right now that's going on our website and you can send an email to i think it's 12 different members of the apple leadership team at once using a cool mm -hmm. tool that we installed there but it comes like from you so it can't be blocked and We've had 12,000 emails get sent to Apple leadership this way, which is sizable. Yeah. And so if folks are, are interested and willing to do that, that's huge because part of what we're also trying to demonstrate to Apple, and by the way, this polls this way. So we've run a nationwide poll three times. We ran it three times because the results were so strong. I was like, there's something wrong with it. Run it again. <laughs> But I mean, because the statistics back, it's like upwards of 90% of Americans think Apple should be detecting child sexual abuse content. And a similar amount already think they are. You know, like demonstrating to them this is something customers want will make it even that much harder for them to say, nobody wants this, right? So we need to show that kind of groundswell of support. So we have some media moments planned. And then there is work we're doing behind the scenes to create pressure on other parts of Apple that is less public, but drawing attention to moments where they're having a lot of attention is part of the strategy. Well, and there's precedent for it, right? I, th I think CVS probably lost some revenue when they stopped selling cigarettes, but their stock shot up and they're a more successful company now as a result. So yeah. listen close, Apple. This, this could actually benefit you in the long run. You mentioned sort of going with the playbook of environmental orgs, reaching out to leaders at Apple. Also, Invisible Children did something similar back in the day with the oh, Culture Maker oh, campaign. Interesting. Yeah, their Coney 2012 had probably close to 50 different politicians, celebrities, folks to reach out to in this way through email or social cool. to pressure them to do something. And it was very successful for them. So I think it's a great model. But I, I, I'm curious, you know, as you're looking at some of these movement building playbooks, what are some of the key components that stand out that folks in the impact space can maybe leverage through their own awareness and, and marketing campaigns? Hmm. I feel like that's almost a better question for you, just given your expertise and background, because digital marketing, digital advertising, like is a lot of that's new for me. And also hmm. understanding like the power of digital. We talk a lot about like, can we move somebody to physically 
go outside and participate like in a peaceful protest or should we only be planning to have them engage with us digitally and like making that kind of the battleground like that tension is something that we are thinking about a lot and like influencer strategy right like other people that people trust so maybe not like the biggest celebrities in the world but like parent influencers, right? Like is a really interesting group for us because we are trying to get parents outraged about this reality and then have that also factor into like, are they getting their kid a phone this year? Like maybe you should wait till we think the phones are safe. So I think that there are ways to leverage our message with more targeted audiences faster than there were before. But I'll be honest with you, like that is newer to me, which is also why having kind of this like bench of experts has been so Mm -hmm. critical. We've been learning a lot. The only other thing I'll say about the playbook that's also been reassuring is we were saying to the climate folks a lot like, well, you have such high issue awareness. Like, of course, people don't want this now. Or of course, everybody sees Greta and it makes sense. And they were like, just remember, like, we felt like you then, (laughs) like 25, 30 years ago, when we were like, sort of some of the first being like, hold on, wait, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that was helpful and kind of reassuring because I think sometimes we've felt like, are are we at the beginning of a movement taking back the internet, kids reclaiming it for themselves, or are we just like too niche to be big? What I'm hoping is that we are at the beginning. I'm fairly certain in 15 years, maybe even 10 years, we'll look back and think the fact that we had like 10-year-old kids on Instagram in the same Instagram as like random adults, I Mm -hmm. think that would be the same as like kids not wearing seatbelts in cars. And I'm not saying they're going to create a whole new Instagram for 11-year-olds, but I do think there will be other, and there have already been improvements, like safeguards made. Like we just didn't think about it before we threw kids in there too. And now we're going to like- out what it actually looks like. So I'm hopeful we're at the beginning versus like, we're just not successful yet. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I like to think of it as more of a continuum. I mean, a lot of good work has been done. The technology is changing. The political yeah. climate is changing. And, you know, as far as Heat Initiative takes it, the impact that it has, there will still be more work to be yes. done. I mean, yeah. it's not a binary thing, right? It's like, yeah. it's an infinite mindset sort of We're just trying to improve it as we go. Yeah. How's the Heat Initiative funded currently? And how is that transition for you? I'm curious, going from like a major gifts person to CEO and running the whole organization. Well, there was luckily some steps in between. At my time at Thorne, like towards the end, I ran the external affairs team and I was on the leadership team. So it was like comms, policy, marketing, fundraising, but that was like the best because I got to hire experts at those things and just learn from Mm -hmm. them. them. And then as part of the leadership team, all the normal things you learn, growth, equity across the different disciplines, the amount of time you spend thinking about the people and the teams and the the people teams and like all those Mm -hmm. things, you know? So I had, I did get to to dabble in that a a bit before I left or observe experts. So that was really lucky. So there was a little more of a transition there. But funding wise, I was lucky because some of the most prestigious foundations that work on sort of child protection globally recognize this gap as well. And so while I was like, I'm ready to leave to go run this campaign, there were others very close by who were like, we agree that this needs to happen. And so that was a very smooth transition where it could be really bumpy. And I think we we want to expand that group of funders too, because I never want it to be seen as like a niche thing again, that like only a certain amount of people want. In my view, they're just the most dedicated <laughs> to the issue. And so they're willing to take a risk on this whole endeavor because it is risky what, you know, what we're doing in many ways because it's new. So it was pretty seamless and very lucky. And we will need to continue to fundraise and do that work over the next few years as well. Why did you guys choose Apple for this first part of the initiative? That is a great question. So we chose Apple for two reasons. One is the minute Apple actually does turn something on (laughs) and start detecting 
there will be kids who are identified within a few hours. That is a given. Even if they only detect known images, some guy most likely who is collecting known images will also be someone who's abusing a kid and that'll get discovered. That's the power of why it's important in part to detect known images because sometimes people are like, well, that kid's already been recovered, which we have a different mindset, which is like, no, this is like in observance of their abuse, like no one should own, have their image, but also collectors can be abusers, right? So anyway, that's honestly first and foremost the reason. But the second reason, which is important as well, is unlike Meta and now X and some of the other companies, Apple is seen as like reputable and kind of like holding these lines and standards around privacy, around user safety and data and all these things. If they do this, it will transform the entire field when it comes to trust and safety. And it will allow for every company who's debating this right now and whether or not they can do it, it will green light them being like, cool, Apple did it. We can do it too. And so that's why. Got it. So you're you're looking at it, direct impact in saving kids and stopping bad actors quickly, but then also the long tail sort of systems change and pressure on the industry. Systems change. Someone's (laughs) had, that's a... That's a very specific term that I that I'm acquainted with, but is like I love that that not many people can pull that out. It's something I'm passionate about and is cool. you know runs throughout my work today. With that in mind, I think it's a good example with with Apple and there are clear things to point to, but in the broader sense, how is Heat Initiative looking at the impact that it's creating? We measure it kind of by what movement are we seeing amongst people we're directly working with and then like who we're trying to influence, knowing that we're not going to get to the top, you know, until we're there. So if you look at things like, are people willing to send the emails and how hard is it to get them to do that? We've had great collaboration across the field with other NGO partners who are not only like helping us, but putting resources behind it. Mm -hmm. That's been another thing that's been so inspiring and really just enjoyable about this has been the connections and the work that we're doing with other orgs and how invested they are in it now Mm -hmm. too. Um, And I think if they're willing to put money and time and effort behind it, that kind of signals that it's, again, we're helping kind of spark something in the field around like going after a company on a specific policy. There's work with shareholders that we can point to, kind of the shareholders being emboldened to put forward a resolution and like be more aggressive about that work. And then we are in communication with Apple. We have been since the beginning and, you know, it's going to be an ongoing conversation, but that's an important piece to maintain and actually keep that connection point so that when we're ready to discuss the next step and what changes could happen, like we're right there, ready to go. So yeah, we have ways to measure the outputs before the outcomes, right? Yep. Outputs, outcomes, and impacts. It's an important distinction. So you're looking at it more as a stakeholder with a cause rather than really antagonistic. Yeah. What we're asking for is very reasonable. And we lament the fact that we even have to be this reasonable. Like this should just be a given. Should be obvious. Right. And it it was, apparently it was them at one time and, you know, (laughs) uh, they forgot or something. I don't know. I can Um, send you all the videos where they talk about how important it is. Right. I'm sure. I'm sure there's, yeah, send them over. We'll, We'll add it to the page. When this campaign runs its course, when you're done with Apple, whether they end up doing what you're calling on them to do or not, what's next for Heat Initiative? What do you see as the future of the organization? That's a great question. So in full transparency, we're still trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great answer. It's funny because we just went through this with our planning. And right now, our mindset is we're fully focused on this because we're trying to prove that these types of campaigns can have effect. If that works, then it's time to think about like, and I really appreciate my team here on this too, because it's very hard to not and I'm sure you would get this having been at like a lot of different orgs and companies in a lot of different phases. It's really hard to not like get in your head of like, who are we as an org? Are we time? Is it time for a rebrand? And I'm really proud of this team because what we're focusing on is let's see if it works 
first and then we'll kind of build the frame. And yet at the same time, we have to have like basic operational function and all of that. But I don't want to do cart before the horse because what if we build that, we fail, right? We're not interested in building an organization just to build an organization. We're interested in whether we can replicate this type of model in this space. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't kidding. I think saying you don't know is a great answer. I mean, things pivot and evolve. You need the latitude to fail if you're going to be successful at anything big anyway. Great. You know, there's different models to look at, right? There's a, a talk by the Splash Founders back in the day, which is a water organization, about putting themselves out of business. Maybe that's one way to go. We mentioned Invisible Children personally. Being a front seat passenger, up close observer to it, was their great legacy is actually the thousands of people that they activated and trained on activism, much more so than yes. what they accomplished directly. Yeah. I think there's a lot of exciting options for Heat Initiative once it really gets going. I really like that frame because one thing I realized or we realized at Thorn is at one point we were like using like eliminate language, like we're going to eliminate it from the internet. The truth is though, you're going to always need entities that are like thinking about the next thing and continuing to fix it. And I heard this thing with Bill Gates once where it was like, they got into zero on malaria and then the mosquitoes evolved and the ones that didn't die because sure. the net lived and they had to start over. <laughs> and it was like, maybe that language sometimes is dangerous. Like you're saying, like eliminate, put yourself out of business. Cause it's like, we actually should adjust to this idea of like constantly needing those in society who are like thinking about what's needed. I, I was just curious what your reaction is to that. Cause you've observed a lot of these things, like how, intense and tight should the goals be sometimes versus more yep. fluid. I'd just be curious what your perspective is on that. Let me answer in the general sense and then some thoughts specifically about Heat Initiative. I think the goals need to be fungible. I think your mission and values, the vision, that's locked in. That's like 100-year scale things. You check on them periodically to make sure it's still aligned, but basically that's it. Yeah quarterly, annual, five-year goals, KPIs, you know, these achievable markers. It's easier said than done, but I like to think I'd be willing to toss those at a moment's notice as soon as they become irrelevant. Yeah. They've been achieved or you recognize they're no longer valid or who right. knows. And I think nonprofits in general need to be more open to that kind of thinking. I also think all these things are hypotheses, right? Like we have an approach, we have what we want to do, we have targets and KPIs. It becomes learning after that. You know, we yeah. achieved them. Great. Maybe that maybe what we achieved was right. Maybe it wasn't, you know, right. but how do we reset them the next time? Learning. Yeah. Love that. I also think with what you're taking on, unfortunately, it's a bit of an arms race, you know, yeah. the same technology that people were using in the fifties to do these things is no longer relevant and new yeah. stuff came along and a few generations came along before we we have our current state with cloud storage and encrypted yeah. messengers and, and things like that. So it's, unfortunately, I think it's a never ending battle. And I think yeah. setting the vision for reducing it is what's important and having intelligent approaches to that, that are in keeping with the times and, and the real state of things, you know, as you go. So even if all these tech companies adopt the practices that you're hoping that they will, these folks will adapt. They'll find a new way and there'll be a new hill to climb, I think, unfortunately. No, I, I think that's true. I really appreciate that perspective. And, you know, sometimes I think about like the postal service was the agency mm -hmm. that worked child pornography cases in the US because it was like in mail. Like 1999, I can't remember exactly. Someone from the U.S. Postal Service testified in front of Congress, and they were basically like, there were 7,000 cases this year in the U.S., and we worked all of them. And so I'm like, if we could get back to that, like, if we could yeah. just get back, like there's just less of it, and there's less, therefore there's less kids being abused. There's less of it messing with kids' minds. There's less of it influencing adults' behavior. The abuse of children is going to be something we're going to constantly have to inoculate society against, and it'll need like new shots at new times. But I think right now there's just an expansion of it in a way that's so harmful and we're trying to reduce it. So it's just helpful hearing you talk about it because I think us starting to adopt that kind of language of like, it's never going to go to zero. It's never going to go away. There's always going to be another company to battle but like we need to just get into yeah. a different energy. Well, and I think there's also 
almost like three tiers of looking at it, right? Like inherently a lot of it's whack-a-mole, right? These guys jump up, yeah. you got to, you know, smack them down. And that's just, to your point, it proliferates so fast. It, it's essentially impossible. There's new technology that'll fingerprint some of this content, retain privacy and block it across the web if companies are using the tech, which we can't be afraid of. I think it's a, a fear-based conversation with a lot of that. But mm-hmm. I think we just have to sort of do that. But the, the third tier of it, I think, is reducing or eliminating the conditions around which this stuff is created, which comes down yeah. to emotional health and, and yes. financial security. And, and I think that's really how you get to the root of, of a lot of this stuff. Totally. Totally agree. This is actually very much a mental health issue. Yeah, that's a whole nother podcast. But like, I think if we can start to frame it that way, too, so that there's more openness to also people who even identify like I have a predilection to consume this, but I don't want to harm kids. Like what spaces do we have for them to ensure that Mm. they don't? Right. Like that is a whole nother area that is like never discussed. And then like I have two sons, eight and six, like I don't want them to get access to this stuff because it like is literally like malware of the mind. One of my old bosses used to say, you know, so it's like, how do we make sure that kids are resilient and that this toxic, illegal content isn't just allowed to like go everywhere at once and have yeah. really bad effect? We're in a world now where we have access to like everything at a moment's notice. So it's personal choice. It's how do you teach kids to disengage when they come close to this stuff and you know things of that nature. In the case of false positives, how do you recommend tech companies handle innocent stuff that, that may appear to an algorithm as if it were sexual abuse material? Yeah. So I think the data is important to look at here. There's a few reports coming out. There's a discussion in the EU about this and precision versus recall. And like when you start to look at the data and understand how rare it is that that false positive occurs, depending on how you've set the parameters of detection software. So there's worlds where you can completely avoid that by making it so exact that you'll probably miss stuff, but you won't have any false positives. And then you can broaden that if you are trying to potentially find material that has not been identified before. But even then, the false positive piece of it is such a small piece compared to like when it gets it right. That's what's put me at ease. But a more systematic approach to it is like that is also why you want companies to have pretty large review teams, health and safety teams, right? So if something passes through, it flags things and it goes to a trust and safety person and it is benign or whatever, like adult porn, that's the end, right? And, And actually there are systems now too, so that that human isn't even like engaging with it in a real way. It's like another system is like, actually, this is wrong. Like move on. The thing that really doesn't happen is that a false positive hit on a platform goes to law enforcement because there's like six steps involved in there Hmm. where the human reviewer at the company gets it wrong. The person at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children gets it wrong. It goes to law enforcement's desk. And, and, and you also have to imagine, too, like these caseworkers are like underwater. They're prioritizing like the worst case they got that day where it's yeah. like verified known eight-year-old in grooming situation, right? So it's like they're – never going to elevate something that they don't think is like real or prosecutable. So there's like a lot of different safeguards in the system. And I think the more people pay attention to how they work and educate themselves on how they work, they'll feel more and more at ease with that. I think something for us to equally worry about is how much are we missing? What kids are slipping through? What kids have been caught up in this for a really long time with no help because for whatever reason, the system's not going off. And like the fact that we don't think of it that way is interesting. And it, it, and it makes sense because we're thinking about, you know, protecting ourselves, individuals, our families. So look at the tech, educate yourself on like how it actually works and the numbers around it. Yeah, no, I think it's a good, it's a good point because I think Almost all of us would agree that, you know, this is something that should be 
handled properly and, and, and yeah. stopped to the extent we can. But I think for parents, you know, I, I could see concerns about getting caught up in something and, you know, that can ruin your life if, if it goes too far. Totally. Well, and let me just add to that, like your kid in the bathtub naked does not set off these systems, right? That's actually really important to say, because I think that that would make a lot of people really nervous as it should. And that is not how these are built. And also that is the kind of thing that would be moved right past if it were flagged, even though it would not be because it, at least for what we're demanding of Apple, for instance, we're asking they only look for known verified hashes. So anything new is not going to spark the system. For me, I, I, I'm always a little concerned when parents start posting that stuff willy nilly, oh, but no. uh, certainly they no. shouldn't be prosecuted, you know, for something like that necessarily. Of course, of course. And there's been a few anecdotal stories written about mm. this in some very prominent places that have done serious damage in making parents concerned about this and they don't have to be. And it's a bummer. What advice would you give to parents who want to do what they can offline to sort of mitigate this risk for themselves and for their own kids? So there are a lot of people that I have the privilege of working with who are even more experts at this than I am. But my takeaway has been throughout time, if you have a really strong relationship with your kid, really good communication, and they trust that they can bring something to you that's bad and you're not going to like overreact or immediately kind of like shame them or penalize them, you're their security. Even if they're in trouble, they know that you'll help them, you're good. Because ultimately what you want is your kid to come tell you when something's gone awry, right? Because there's like all these different things you can be tapping into, but pre-internet, right? It was like, well, what had kids at lower risk and it's like when kids feel like they are dangerous situations and they know that you they can call you and you'll come pick them up right so it's like that same level of trust not shaming one interesting thing I don't think parents think about but would be kind of cool to share with your audience is also removing the shame that parents feel so like if your kid is the kid that takes a naked selfie and now it's like all over the school we need to remove the shame that then that parent feels, then they're so embarrassed and then they don't talk about it. And then, so there's not also a culture of like, hey, this is happening, like let's all deal with it. Instead, it's like, it's very much pushed down. And I think it's inhibiting parents from working together and from parents coming forward and being like, this happened, can you help me? Getting help themselves too, to help their family. So anything around naked selfies and kids and all of that, we just need to destigmatize it and just be like, it's unfortunate it happened. Now let's actually like deal with it instead of like, no one's going to do it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a great point. I mean, we, we were talking earlier about mental health issues surrounding this and having open conversations. I, I do see where it's improving, I, I think, but I know that there are some very deep cultural influences here with different aspects of this. And yeah, I agree. The more we can destigmatize it and take the shame out of it and create those safe spaces in our own communities and families, the easier yeah. this will be for everybody. Yeah. I would love for people who are more curious about this issue to not be afraid to engage. And, and what I mean by that is people don't want to get it wrong. They don't want to say the wrong words. They don't want to say the wrong thing. In particular with child sexual abuse, I think it just kind of closes you up out of fear of making a mistake almost. And I think what we would encourage is for people to, to try and engage and learn and not be afraid to talk about it more and get it wrong. You know what I mean? And then it's okay. Mm -hmm. And like be corrected. Cause I think there's a barrier of entry with this issue that is really hard to get past. And I would also ask people to start observing in our society where there's these like little hints to it a lot and it's still kind of a joke and thinking about what does that perpetuate and how can we make sure that we're really putting kids first when it comes to this issue. Like everyone says, you know, kids first, kids first, but what does that actually mean? You know, so I think those are just ideas to leave folks with. But I mean, from a technology standpoint, from a thank you for listening to our complaints about Apple standpoint, like you've really given us great 
latitude to share a lot about that. So thank you for that. I've really enjoyed this conversation immensely. And I think I think there's a lot of value here for the audience in general, but also some pretty actionable stuff for social sector leaders to learn from. I know I've learned from it. So thank you. I, I, I'm curious, how do you feel? Like, are you optimistic about this, regardless of what big tech decides to do? Are you optimistic that this situation will improve over the next several years or how are you feeling about it? Yes. And, I, and I'm hopeful that there's also going to be a backlash of like tech running our lives. Hmm. I think we're already seeing some ripples of that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I loved your analogy too, by the way, of these trust and safety issues being akin to the seatbelts, you know, from 20 years ago. Oh, by the way, no one wanted to ban smoking on planes. <laughs> you know, like yeah. that was really popular. The seatbelt laws were really unpopular. So there's just some really interesting parallels. You look at China, that's like they banned kids from being on TikTok certain hours of the day. On one hand, you're like, that's insane. That's so like authoritarian and horrible. And then on the yeah. other hand, you're like, is that good though? Like maybe you don't want kids on social the whole yeah. night. I don't know. I think there's going to be a backlash. More time in the ocean with the whales instead. Yeah. A lot of the battles I'm fighting these days are around integrity and, and common sense. Yeah. And how we deal with some of this stuff. All right. Well, before we wrap, just a few quick questions. Outside of your current career, if you're doing something totally unrelated to social impact, what do you think you'd be doing? Interior design. Oh, interesting. Why? Oh, I just love it. Love it. Love every part of it. It's the art. It's the color. It's the shapes. It's how it all fits together. It's beauty working on something that can be so horrific and ugly and dark. Sort of the same thing you're doing now, but in a different format. <laughs> Creating better spaces for people. Yeah. Oh, huh. that's cool. You know, in some ways, it's a different expression yeah. of the same idea. I love that so much. At some point, I'd love to own a, a bar or something like that. And I think about creating a space conducive to certain conversations or interactions as part of that. Cool. When you're ready to move on from Heat Initiative, uh, move on to the next project, retire, what's a big goal for yourself? Something that you would like to have accomplished in this part of your career? I'm interested in running for office and I'll say why. Um, and I don't know what it looks like yet, but one of the issues that we've had from a legislative point of view, and it, it is less so right now too, because we have found some really good champions, but we got advice, like this was way back when I was at Thorn and stuff. It was like, find your member who's willing to take this on and like have this be their thing and then like attach yourself to them. And But like we were struggling, like who is who are those members? And they have now identified themselves more, a little bit in the Senate and in the House. But one thing that is still true is members who can question technology experts is still an area where I think we could use infusion of people who know a lot about tech and tech policy. So this is now not even just speaking about myself. This is just a need in the field that exists. And so sometimes I'm like, well, instead of waiting for that person, should we just be that person? But I'm also really impressed by those who are out there doing it already and working through those channels to get it done. Yeah. I mean, that was made super clear over the hearings, you know, in the past few years with big tech, just being able to ask the right questions seems to be a challenge at this point. We talked about some of the people that inspired you in your early career. Who's somebody or a handful of folks that you really look up to now that you know, you admire or learn from or has, has taught you a lot? There's this one climate activist that we've been working with. I feel like he'll like kill me if I mention him by name, but um, he calls himself the silverback because we like pulled him out of retirement. This poor man was trying to retire, is still trying to retire, and we just call him all the time. <laughs> like, what about this? What about this? Um, I'm going to just say his name. His name's Michael Marks. He's been an incredible ally and mentor during this process. Oh, there's been so many though. Early on, another sort of supporter came to us and was like, uh, you've got this. Like, you're you're all gonna win. You can do it. If not you, who? Like, and just such confidence. And you're just like, wow, like, why do you, why? Why do you believe so much? So we've been really lucky in that sense. Maybe feels obvious or something, but full circle back to my parents. You know, I'm raising three small kids, eight, six, and three. My husband has a very intense job. I have a very intense job. Like, we would not be able to be doing this without them. And I'm relearning about parenting and what matters from them and watching them interact with my kids now. And that's been a really special 
special time in our lives. Hmm. That's cool. I think I sort of asked you this and we've gotten into the politics conversation, but when you're ready to leave Heat Initiative, whatever that next thing is, what's something with Heat Initiative that you want to have accomplished? I think we're going to keep going until something at Apple changes. That is the goal. Either we can't keep going, we get burned out, we run out of money, we, you know, something happens, but I feel very clear that if we fail, that's actually a really important learning that the field is like struggling to set up this kind of pressure lever. And it's not just us, like, you know, who else is doing it well and maybe someone else is doing it better. Like let's lean into their effort instead. Or we're not communicating clearly about it enough with the public. So people don't get it and they're not ready to jump on the bandwagon because they don't know what we're talking about. So I think no matter what we'll learn. And I really liked your frame around that. Lastly, how can people learn more about your work and, and get in touch? And and I think in this case, even beyond just go to the website and donate yeah. or sign up, but like, how do people really take action as part of this campaign? Well, as part of this campaign, going to our website, which is heatinitiative.org, initiatives has a lot of eyes. So you really got to take your time when you type that one in. <laughs> uh, we've kind of outlined the case against Apple. It, it's good because there's some specific records there of cases involving the products. And it helps you understand like what we're talking about and why it's so important. But on there, you can send an email to Apple and it's safe and secure. It's not like other people will know that you sent it, but it sends them an email that's like, hey, you know, I have questions about this policy. So that's really effective because that gives us an ability to say like Apple is hearing from the public, um, takes five minutes. So that's really, really appreciated if folks can do that. But I think on this movement, I will say that for the first time since I've been working on this, we are feeling this groundswell of momentum with lawmakers. And so calling members and saying like, hey, I'm really worried about online child sexual abuse or sexual abuse in the internet. Raising this with your local member like really helps us because that is ultimately what members defer to is like what issue are their members bringing them. So that's always huge. Um, and then I'd also like to recommend the few um, documentaries that are really powerful and feature films about this issue or like issue adjacent. Athlete A is one that's about the gymnasts and the Larry Nassar case. And then there's like more feature films like Spotlight and others. So I'd love to give you a list kind of of ones that I recommend for folks too, because we got to give people ways to learn about this too that is like more entertaining than just reading articles or things that we've written. So would love to provide you with sort of more of those options because there really are a decent amount of both docs and features that do a nice job of covering this issue. Please send it over. It's such a complex issue. The more people can understand about it and get comfortable with those conversations, the better. Yeah. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for the time and the conversation. I'm inspired by the work that you're doing. Happy to support in any way we can and really appreciate your time and, and sharing yourself and your insights with me and our audience. Thank you. Thank you for being so interested in me as a whole person versus me as just heat leader. I really appreciated that and enjoyed it and learned a lot. And I wrote that anecdote down about being like an interior decorator of the online world. And I'm going to cherish that nugget from this forever. So thank you so much for your time and energy that you put into this as well. Really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. And look forward to talking again soon. Well, that wraps up episode one of the new season of Cause and Purpose. We have a lot more in store for you. So we hope you'll keep listening as we roll out future episodes. You can learn more about the HEAT Initiative at heatinitiative.org and in the show notes at causeandpurpose.org. Big thanks to Sarah Gardner for joining us. And thanks as well to the team at Bryce and Gillette for introducing us to Sarah and a few of our upcoming guests. If you haven't heard of them, Bryce and Gillette is a mission-driven strategic communications and public affairs firm that partners with organizations, companies, candidates, and individuals fighting to make the world a more safe, just, healthy, and prosperous place for everyone. I've been a big fan of their work since they launched a few years back, and I'm excited to have their support and collaboration on the show. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and share it with a friend or colleague you think might find it interesting. Cause and Purpose is a production of Altruist.org, 
On behalf of myself, Sarah, and our entire team, thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to speaking with you again soon.